We're going to be talking about tonight, we're actually going over chapters 3 and 4 in your Gospel Coach book, and we're going to be looking at warring with idols tonight. We're going to be looking at uh, performance-centered leadership versus a gospel-centered leadership tonight. Because there's a clear difference. I don't know if you, if you figure that out yet, or you've been going through the book, but there is a cl huge, clear difference. So let's look at some of the problems from performance-centered leadership. And, and, you know, when performance is the motivation of a leader, success actually starts to become that functional savior. And, and from that, comfort becomes the very thing that feeds our flesh. And that's the problem with performance-driven leadership, is that it is actually rooted in our flesh, in the flesh, and typically in many churches, and, and maybe you've experienced this, I know I've experienced this in some churches past, that typically in church leadership, not so much in the staff, although it, it does happen among staff members, but typically in a lot of church memberships, you, you, you see that a, a leadership style is kind of really more from the performance side because of sometimes the leaderships, they may, uh, they, in the profession, they may own their own business or, or they may be like a manager or from a supervisor position. There's always that, you know, that, that thing where you've got to perform, man. You got, cause that's, what, that's how you make money in business, right? So sometimes it's easy for that to transfer over into church leadership. And, and in church leadership, I mean, while success, and, and performance is not necessarily a bad thing, but, it, but it, if it becomes the goal, and success becomes the goal, then it has the likely potential to become an idol. Not only in our personal lives, but it also can become an idol in the church. And if the leadership is rooted in performance alone, then that performance is what is going to become an idol to us. So performance-centered leadership can generate numbers that look great. And it produces a level of comfort. But what does comfort do? It feeds our flesh, doesn't it? When we get comfortable, when we feel that success, I think that's what feeds our flesh. So performance-centered living is rooted in the flesh. It's a worship of selfish success. It plays into idols of comfort security as well as power and approval. That's at the very top of your sheet there. You know, the Bible admonishes us to walk by the Spirit and put away those things that are in the flesh. Look what Galatians 5.16 teaches. It says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that what you want to do and keep you from doing the things that the Spirit would have you to do. So if our leadership is rooted in performance alone, then we actually begin to reject the centrality of the gospel in a person's life. And before I go any further, um, let's, let's stop for just a moment and let's talk about the nature of sin and idols. You see, people generally operate out of four primary idols. And these are the things that feed our flesh. They're rooted in comfort, security, power, and approval. And the problem is it is performance-centered society that we rarely get down to the root issues of why we sin so often. We generally see the surface-level sins, and we tend to focus on those sometimes. But we don't really address, well, why am I doing these things? And get down to the root of the problem. What do I mean? Well, let's use sexual, sexual type sins as an example. You know, sexual immorality, impurity, uh, sensuality. A person might be acting out in this way, and we try to address the surface. You know, like what are the, what's the underlying root level that, that of the motives that are at play in this? Well, comfort could be one. A person that maybe has gone through a divorce or maybe gone through a, a, a breakup from a girlfriend, boyfriend kind of uh, relationship. Comfort could be at play. It makes you feel, it, you know, when you start going out and you're on the rebound and you're looking, you know, it makes you feel numb to the pain that is inside. Or it could even be security. That, which is probably the one that's at play at most. You know, that feeling wanted. You've gone through a bitter divorce and maybe after a couple of years that loneliness starts setting in. Or maybe you're just trying to find that girlfriend and that boyfriend, you know, and that loneliness is starting to set in. And, and, you, and you just want that need to feel loved. 
all of a sudden, man, and that comes from a feeling of that security. We want to be loved. We want to be noticed. We want to feel, feel like that. So for uh, one person, it can also be power in a relationship. A person that has that controlling type you know, way in their relationship and wants to control the other person. Or it could be for someone, it could be actually approval. You know, that you feel desired and you feel good. You know, like you're going out and you're strutting your stuff to get a notice. And like and st people start noticing you. So you're like, all right, I still got it, you know. And so you start seeking that approval in that relationship. Let's use a different illustration. What about the accumulation of material possessions? How does that play out? Well, in comfort, you could have everything you need, but yet you don't give anything to God or you don't attribute any success to God. That how you got there. Or, or what about security? Having money in the bank. You know, having that, that financial security. Having that security that, that no matter what kind of trouble comes down the road, you can buy your way out of it kind of thing. Or you can just throw down a credit card and say, hey, I'll pay it off at the end of the month, no problem. Kind of like you don't need God. You don't have to depend on God. You know, my mother, she's, she's retired. She's 80 years old. And she doesn't know all. She's not really bad off. She's not well off. She's certainly not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. She has maybe just enough that if she's smart and wise, she'll get through life, okay, the rest of her life. And all of a sudden, man, in one month, car breaks down. All of a sudden, she, there's a leak under her slab in her house. And, and her roof is leaking. I mean, this is some substantial things, you know, that, that are, that's coming up in, in, in her life. And, and so... It would be easy, though, for a wealthy person to go, well, you know what? Big deal. I'll just throw down and it's not a problem. And, and, and that feeling of security comes up. But, uh, you know, it, it's no wonder why the Bible says it's, 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 it's really easier for a, a rich man to enter through the eye of a needle than it is for him to enter into the kingdom of God because of that security. And, and you know, might you use your resources to, to even control some people sometimes as a power idol or might feel a sense of approval and identity and the fact that you've had some financial success in your life. And so there's four idols that can be a play at here. And generally, all of us tend to usually lean to either one or two of those idols. And so the problem as a coach becomes getting down to the root motivations of our actions and the actions of the ones that we are coaching to begin to remove those idols or those roots from our lives, which are, are actually idols that are stealing worship that God deserves in our lives. So, let's, for instance, someone that is uh, not tithing as a means of performance, we might try to wow them or pressure them into giving to a cause. Um, you know, it, it may, or even come out of an act, we may even kind of guilt them into an act of obedience to tie from that standpoint. And comfort and security is, is most likely the culprit that is preventing them from tithing. Uh, most likely in the root because, because of the, the security they have. They don't want to let go, can't give God that. I might need that later on down the road thing. Or they just like living comfortably. And that's probably the root of the real reason of why they're not tithing. And so until we can topple those, those root idols in our lives, then we'll probably never completely and fully trust God in our lives. And the same logic can be applied to pretty much really any sin that we come up with. You know, we need to have this mental filter that's running through our heads at all times. Now, does this stem from comfort? Or does this sin stem from security? Or does this sin stem from power? Or, or maybe even approval. We need to have that mental filter that we're constantly checking ourselves or checking the person that we're even coaching to find out, to get down to the root problems. And Holy Spirit, this is what we should be praying, that the Holy Spirit would reveal to us these things that are at work in our lives or in somebody else's lives. And, and, and where's pride in all this? Well, pride's kind of like a tree. And I, I've got this really cheesy drawing out here. I'm not an artist, so kind of forgive me. I kind of feel like Carl Rove on Fox News. You ever see him hold up that, that, that board, you know, thing? But this is kind of like this tree represents pride. And the roots are right here. We have comfort, security, power, approval. That's what's deep. That's it. Now, this, this pride tree... It gives off some fruit sometimes. And that fruit can be in the form of addictions or porn or lying or greed or selfishness. And those are the fruits. But when you start seeing these things pop up in your life, is that the problem right there? No. The real problem's down here. 
That's where they exist. That's what we need to start looking at and, and, and evaluating ourselves when we see these sins pop up in our lives and in the people's lives that we care about to get down to the root problem. Does all that make sense to you so far? Nod your head. <laughs> Y'all look at me like, I don't know. Well, I hope so. Um, let me talk about, about just a little bit about functional saviors for one moment because it's critical to our overall gospel coaching that we understand what functional saviors are and uh, you know what happens in life is these root idols amongst other things become to serve as functional saviors in our lives let's go back to the money thing for just a second if you have money your need for God starts to disappear a little bit. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. You know, like I said earlier, when trouble comes, you can kind of buy your way out of it. Uh, you know, food, cars, houses, you know, that, that sense of comfort or that sense of security that it brings. Uh, it's so easy to begin to trust those things and uh, leaving a little room for God in our life because we're really relying on our abilities to either make money or our abilities to where we work to help get us out of these problems. So people or things can become functional saviors as well. You know, we put our hope and our trust in our spouse. And, and, and if you've gone through a divorce or, or maybe you've lost your boyfriend, go, girlfriend, and all of a sudden, like I said earlier, that loneliness starts to set in, you know what your functional savior becomes? Looking for a wife, looking for a husband, looking for a boyfriend, looking for a girl, that becomes your functional savior. You start looking at those things to bring that comfort or that security back in your life instead of looking at God. So you see how you can start trace those things right back down to the root level of what we're going through. So, you know, our identity needs to be wrapped up in a gospel-centered life. And, you know, one of the worst functional saviors of all, guess what it is? Point, your, point at your chest. That's you. It's me. That's one of our worst functional saviors that we come up with. You know, if you have performed well, you can easily be deceived by your own heart into believing that your success is an indicator, listen, of that God loves you. You ever notice that? Sometimes when things are going great, man, everything's going your way. Man, God's blessing me. You know, I'm reading my Bible every day, you know, I'm praying every day. I've even made it to church all four Sundays this week. And you begin to think God loves you. God's blessed you in your life. And when you don't experience that type of success, you have this sense of guilt or shame that God all of a sudden doesn't love you. And then we, and even in the world, we find ourselves longing for success no matter what the cost is. But when we achieve it, it often creates this false sense of pride that we have. And you see this played out in the world over and over and over again. You know, with people like actors or musicians, the Hollywood type, or even successful businessmen like, you know, the Donald Trumps of the world. You know, I mean, for instance, the king of rock. Who was that? Elvis. Elvis had everything, right? Where's Elvis now? He's dead. Michael Jackson, king of pop. Where's he at now? Had everything. He's dead. The, king, you know, the, 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 the queen of pop, Whitney Houston, unfortunately, where's she at? She's dead. And the list goes on and on and on and on. And we, we tend to look at all this material success. And even though maybe most of us in this room, our success as far as what we've accumulated, and, and those things are probably not on that level, but we tend to kind of rely into those things. And, and, and here's what the Apostle Paul describes as success. It's on your sheet there. Look at Philippians 3, verses 2 through 11. He goes, he goes, look out for the dogs and look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he's got reason for confidence in the flesh, I've got more, he says. He gets circumcised on the eighth day. He goes through his resume right here. Circumcised on the eighth day. The, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law. He was a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul's saying right there, hey, as far as obeying the law, I was 
perfect. Nobody beats me. I was on top of it. He goes on to say in verse 7, he goes, he goes but whatever gain that I had, he goes, I count it loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I had suffered the loss of all things and count them as basically garbage in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, becoming like him, get this, this is, this is on the surface, this seems so insane to us, becoming like us, him in his death, that by any means possible that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. See, Paul's goal in life was to cross the finish line. Basically, Paul's goal was to die so he could go be with Christ. He looked forward to the resurrection. That's what his motivation was. It seems kind of crazy. I mean, I don't think, I see you know, a lot of people, certainly myself, you know, hey, I can't wait to die. I mean, but that was the way Paul lived right there. That was truly the motivation. He wanted to not only cross the line, because you know when runners cross the line, they haven't won the prize yet, have they? They still have to go to the winner's podium, stand on there and receive the trophy, right? Paul was right at that tape. He was about ready to bust the tape and cross the line. But that wasn't his motivation, just crossing the line. It was to receive his prize. Man, he couldn't wait to see Jesus face to face to be resurrected from the dead. So look on your sheet there. All, our alternative to performance-centered living is gospel-centered living. See, our life is not rooted in idols. But our life is rooted in the Spirit, and our identity is in Christ. We live lives of worship, in community, and mission on God. And our motives in Him are pure. That's gospel-centered living. See, gospel-centered leaders are effective leaders. There's a difference between successful leaders and effective leaders. What do I mean by that? Well, basically good coaches are effective coaches. See, I, I never want to be known as this pastor or a leader or, or a gospel coach that's known for success or performance. I re, I'm serious. I really don't want to be known. I just simply want to desire to be effective. And, and what I mean, there's a, there's a difference here. In other words, I would rather have one disciple that is just totally sold out for Jesus and has his eyes fixed on finishing the race that that guy will go out and lead other people to Jesus and disciple them so they in turn will lead people in Jesus and disciple them. I would rather have that one guy than 10 guys that are faithful to attend church any day. Hey, I, right before the small group start up, I can go out there and I can get people fired up. Hey, you know what, lead small group, sign up, sign up, sign up, sign up, and pressure them to sign up and get 50 people to sign up and do a group. I got 50 groups started, woohoo, you know? But what the reality of that is, is after when the groups start, you know what happens to most of those guys? They kind of, uh, you know, I'm changed my mind. Or maybe nobody showed up to the group because they didn't really pour themselves into it and they fall by the wayside. It, that would be easy. That would be success as far as the numbers. But what is, what is reality is what is gospel-centered leader when you have people that are serious about pouring their lives into other people so that they will in turn pour their lives into others. So this is what we need to go over right here. And we, if we're going to be parents in the faith, this is where we need to lead people. And this is where we're headed. Look at Luke 10, 27. And he answered, here it is. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your strength, and all of your mind, and your neighbor or the people around you as yourself. That's pretty hard to do at times, but that's what he calls us to. And our identity is supposed to be rooted in Christ, not performance. So if our attendance or if our giving is down or if it's up, Hey, God's still in control. We're still going to give God the praise and glory. You know, God still loves me the same no matter what I do. But it's up to me to make the right choices to live a life that's focused and rooted in the gospel. You know, if you have more money or less, hey, God still loves you the same. You're still on level playing fields with Him. So when we do things like give or, or serve, we're supposed to do all those for His glory and not our own. 
Because isn't it easy to get the focus on us? Think, man, that was awesome. Look what, how, how I got that done and everything. It's so easy. Where does that come from? A lot of it comes from where you work. Because that's the motivation. That's what's driving you, that success. You get all those pats on the bats, all those, the, you know, the attaboys. Hey, you did a great job, you know. And sometimes that filters over into the church or to, in this case, live in a gospel-centered life. And we start getting our focus on performance instead of what God would have us to be focused in on. So, in this gospel-centered living model, and it's by the way, it's nothing new. I know it might kind of seem like, oh, this is a new thing, but honestly, it's not new, okay? We're just simply getting back to what Jesus told us to do in the first place. You know, sometimes I get kind of tickled, and uh, you know, I see, and it seems like more than, than, than any time I've ever seen since I've been saved for 25 years, I'm starting to see more and more books pop up on discipleship, which I love. It's great. Hey, let's write some more. But you know, if I could get a, if I could get a publisher to do this, I, I'm serious, I would do this. I would write a book and title it The Greatest Discipleship Book Ever. And when you open the cover, it just had the passages of Jesus leading his disciples. And that's it, because that's, that's what we need to do. So, you know, all these books are great and wonderful, and I highly recommend them. But it's really nothing new, man. We're just getting back to what a church is supposed to be doing in the first place. That's what we're doing. So, you know, we abandon ourselves and realize that we're willing slaves to God who created us. He saved us, and He died for us, who is worthy to be worshipped. So we crucify those idols in our life. That's what we have to begin to start doing, and these surface-level sins through a process called sanctification. It's simply being set apart for God. We were set apart for God to live a holy life for Him. So how we, well, we are continually pointing people back to the cross and, and acknowledgement that Christ's death was sufficient to redeem us from all sin, past, present, and future. And when this kind of living takes root in our life, mission is hard to contain. You can't stop it. It's just like how the early church started. You know, if the early church had started in a building and everybody just came, kind of came, you know, for an hour or whatever a week, it would have been easy to shut that thing down off the bat. The Pharisees could have went in and just, you know, lit it on fire, you know, run everybody. But what happened, actually, they actually in a, in a, essentially did that. But what did it do? It scattered them, man. You know, what, for what Satan meant to happen for bad, God meant to happen for good, and it scattered them all through the regions. And all of a sudden, little, little home cells started popping up. We, we call them small groups. Little churches started popping up. And all of a sudden, from that grew huge. And this thing just cut. So when you really get a hold of God and get, get, let God get a hold of you, the mission is impossible to contain. And a passion to spread the word of Jesus is going to rise up in us. And we'll no longer live for ourselves, but the one who died for him, that we might have life. You know, you've heard the term dead men walking. You ever seen those t-shirts, I'm a dead man walking? Well, it's essentially true because we're supposed to be dead to sin. That's what allowed Paul and others to be so bold. That's why they were so bold. They understood this. The, the things that, of the world didn't even matter to them. It didn't bind them into, you know, being quiet or worrying about what people were going to think of them or, or that feeling of rejection that we so fear sometimes. They weren't worried about that. They felt like, hey, I'm already dead. So what? I'm going on with this thing. And so they were consumed with the reality of the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be consumed of. You know, they lived for this. They lived for Jesus Christ. And it's that kind of passion or is that kind of passion the hallmark of your Christian walk right now? Can you say that? Now, if you can't right now, then there's something you can do for it. You, you can make that choice. But this is what the life that he calls us to. And, and you know, all you have to do, if not, is just carefully examine your heart. And, and it might reveal something that's going on maybe a little deeper in your life. It might reveal that power, that approval, that comfort or security, those root sins that that's, is a reason why we're not being that way. And, uh, you know, our answer is, a, is a, just an old-fashioned word. You don't hear a lot of it anymore. It's just simply repent, repentance. It's just simply repent from those things that are not right in our life, that don't line up with God's Word, and turn from those. It's just plain old repentance that we need to apply to our lives, and, and we can change them and act them. And so we can begin to redirect ourselves around the reality of the gospel. And, and it removes a lot of stress in our life when we do that. You know, if we'll start living a gospel-centered life, we'll probably put the, uh, 
the hair color industry out of business. You know, we don't need to cover up all that gray. It won't come back so quick. Amen? So it removes a lot of stress from our lives. It removes the need to continually to feel like you got to perform or even pretend when you come in here, you know, put on the Christian act. It removes all that. You don't have to do that anymore because you're living a gospel-centered life and righteous before God. And we're righteous before God, man. He, he, that's what he died for, so that we would be found righteous in him or to be made right in him. And so we can now walk in these lives of humble repentance. That's what we got to get back to. And so we actively live out a new reality to where we realize, as Tim Keller states in his book, the solution is to, to our sin problem is not to simply change our behavior, but to reorient and center our entire heart and life on God. We tend to focus on changing our behavior, don't we? We don't really put Romans 12 verse 2 into practice, that we're not supposed to be conforming to the world, but we're supposed to actually be changing our mind. How do you do that? By renewing your mind through the Word of God that we may prove what is acceptable. It, it, that's what we're supposed to do. Allow the Word of God to change your heart, to change the way you think. It, and you'll see some amazing things begin to, to happen in your lives. So, if we can pull out the, the, you know, all these sins by the root, as I showed you on the tree there, if we can begin to pull out those roots. You ever, a lot of you ever pull weeds out of your, uh, your garden or your flower beds? You know, I love Roundup myself. I'm just a Roundup guy. I used to own a commercial landscaping business, and you know, like Roundup's your best friend. You know, all Roundup is is a chemical equivalent of vinegar and salt, basically. And when you spray it on that plant, you know what happens? That the leaves actually absorb that stuff. They think it's energy. They think it's food. They're going like, woohoo, this is all right. And all of a sudden, they absorb it. It goes down to the root. And all of a sudden, that weed starts dying from the root up. That's why you start to see it turn brown. See, that's the process. We, we can't deal, if, if you just had a chemical that just killed the foliage, it's going to come back. Or if you pull the weed up, you don't get the root, it's going to come back. That's the idea here. We've got to get down to the root and say, well, why am I doing that? Why am I involved in that sin? Where does that come from? Well, how am I feeding the flesh in this? Is it coming from security? Is it coming from co uh, comfort, power? Maybe I'm trying to come from approval. And so we don't need to look at the surface, but we need to dig down and find out what is the root cause of all that's going on right now in, my, in our life and in, in the others. So lasting life change can generally happen if we'll do that. So we need to continually ask the question in dealing with sin, why, why, why in the world do I keep continually going back and engaging in this behavior? And so when found, we repent. And the Spirit enables us to change, and visible fruit starts being manifested in our lives to where people are not only hearing us talk about the gospel, but they're starting to see us live it out. And that's where it really matters to people. I think they've heard enough preaching. They need to see some fruit. They need to see some people living out the gospel. So, ultimately, all sin is basically on a belief in the gospel. And a gospel coach leads a disciple or leader to recognize the idols and then through repentance begin to experience the gospel transformation by putting off the old, that corruptible, deceitful self and begin to put on a new self. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 teaches us. Look on your sheets there at Ephesians 4, 17. He is, Paul's writing here and he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to the hardness of their heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you have learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. And here we go. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desire. See, it always points back to the flesh, doesn't it? Verse 23, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. There's that Romans 12 too again. It pops up again. And to put on the new self 
created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. So basically, Paul's given this cool little illustration of something that we do every day in practical living. You know, when you get home from work, what do you do? You take off those dirty clothes and you get cleaned up and you put on something new. That's the idea here, that we begin to remove that sin in our life, get down to the root problem is why am I doing this? And begin to, to, to put on something new, that the Holy Spirit, and begin to live in a righteous and holiness manner that he calls us to. So finally, for those who will be... Uh, are going to be coaching others or maybe you're not ready for that yet. Maybe I'm just I'm just kind of tagging along learning and, and applying this stuff to my life and maybe some of you are maybe not quite ready for that yet and that's that's fine. But for those that you are, look on your sheet with Ephesians 4.25 teaches us. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. And there's that word neighbor again to all those who are around you. So we need to speak the truth in love with each other. So here's the challenge, and I'm almost done here. We'll open it up for some questions of any, anything you might have. Here's the challenge. When you start messing with people's idols as you get into gospel coaching and you start developing relationships with people and you start getting into people's idols, you can count on this. Some of them are going to get upset with you. Believe me, that will happen. But it's what good parents do, right? I mean, as my sons were growing up, man, when I saw them doing some stuff that I, I could see that word, the word this was going, I know where this is headed, I've been there, I get this, and I try to correct them. A lot of times, there's that rebellion. They didn't like it. They didn't like the consequences of, of what they were doing. But that's what a good parent does, right? So when we see things that are going on in somebody's life, man, we're there to help them walk through it. But the only way you're going to do it is not by surface. If someone's struggling with alcohol or pornography, the, 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 the answer to helping somebody through that struggle with por pornography is not to assign a monitor to them to, to watch them, you know, when they get on the internet. It, it, it's not to cut their cable. That won't do anything, man. Why? Because there's a root issue at, at, at hand there that needs to be addressed. Why is somebody an alcoholic? There's a root issue there. There's something that you need to get back down to find out why is that? And those are the questions that we need to look at. And then we begin to see good things starting to come on the scene. First thing to do is, that, is, is go down and tear these idols and restore the worship to someone to the one true God instead of the idols that we serve so many times in our life. And I don't know about y'all, since we've been going through this, it's caused me to reevaluate everything. In my prayer time, as I'm driving here in the mornings, coming to the office, I'm starting to look at things differently. It's not, it's not anything that I don't know. It's things that I need to apply. It's things that I need to look a little deeper in my life. Well, Donald, why, why are you getting angry? Where's that? What's, what's the problem with that? It's caused me to look a little bit deeper in some of my own issues. And, and so that's what this is doing for us. It's causing us to look down a little further to find out, well, what's the root problem? What's the root sin? And if we're going to be healthy and mature and growing towards parenthood, and hopefully that is the goal of everybody to grow up to be mature Christians so that we can begin to pour our lives into others. If we're going to start doing that, then we need to continually, and it's a continual, it's an everyday thing. It's not a one-time fix-all. It starts every single day that you get up. One of my prayers for myself is every day that I pray for myself. You know, I, I pray Colossians 1-9 quite honestly all the time. I'm asking God to give me that spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, to do the right thing, to make the right choice. That, that Why? So I'll be a better person? No. So I'll ultimately glorify Him. That's the goal. That we all ultimately, everything we do, everything that you do where you work, everything that you do out in public, everything that you do is constantly pointing people to the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what all this is about. In order to do that, Man, we got to start taking a little deeper look inside ourselves and try to figure out, you know, why am I doing this? What's the root problem? So we need to continually war against the idols, those root idols of comfort, security, power, and approval. The Bible tells us to examine ourselves. How often? Daily. It's a daily thing when you walk up. And here's the deal now. 
If you, if you, you, you your mind was set that morning, you got up, man, I'm going to do this. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to glorify God. And something just, boom, it blindsides you. And man, you lose it or whatever the case may be. Or you just indulge in some kind of sin. The next day, the book of Romans also teaches us to offer, offer up our life as a living sacrifice. That's daily. At the end of the day, if you could not offer up your life as a living sacrifice to God, start the next day. Tell God, I'm so sorry. Repent from it. Ask Him to help you, give you the strength to defeat that sin in your life. You know what? He will do it. He will do that as you continue to ask Him. Let that be your prayer. Check out Colossians 1 9. Allow that to be your prayer. You know, because these idols, comfort, security, power, and proof, that's what steal and worship from God. That's what steal and worship from God. And so before we begin to. to to start walking with God in a deeper, in a closer way, in a gospel-centered relationship. Before we start leading other people down that same path, we ourselves have to walk that.